Hey everyone, Dr. Jolene Brighton here, and I'm super excited to be talking to Dr. Michael Murray today. And if you don't know Dr. Murray, well, you definitely should, because this guy has over 30 years of practice under his belt, and you've published more than 30 books. Am I right about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here and for taking the time to chat with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I would love to help my audience get to know you a bit more. And you know, you are a naturopathic doctor, so that much they can gather. But how did you get into this food as medicine business? Well, uh, like many people that uh, get into this field, uh, I had some personal health challenges and uh, conventional medicine had no answers for me. So uh, I went and saw a naturopathic physician and it was a life-changing experience. So. I decided I need to learn more about this medicine, and the more I learned about it, the more it resonated with something deep inside me, and I knew I wanted to be a naturopathic doctor. And, and then uh, as I started my uh, education, it occurred to me that if natural approaches to health and healing are based upon truth, that they should be able to stand up to scientific investigation. So I really started dedicating myself to uh, finding out what is available in the medical literature, which would support the use of diet, lifestyle modification, uh, uh, proper attitude, and of course, uh, the use of uh, natural products, uh, herbs, and, and dietary supplements. And what I found was is that for most common health conditions, people can get better results uh, from using these natural approaches than you, than you can for many of the drugs that are in vogue. And it's a great myth out there that uh, natural approaches don't have any science underneath them because the truth of the matter is for most common health conditions, you can build a stronger scientific case for these natural approaches. Absolutely. So well said. And I think that you know, we, we can recognize that if food and what you put in your mouth every day has the ability to create disease, then certainly it can reverse and also prevent it. I'm curious, you, you said something that piqued my interest. There's a lot of myths out there. What's like one of the biggest food myths or myths about diet that you hear? Well, I mean, things have come a long way. Uh, back in the 80s, when I first started studying uh, health and nutrition, uh, the American Cancer Society, Society came out and said that uh, there's no correlation between diet and cancer. And then a few years later, they came back and said that 95% of all cancers are related to, to diet and lifestyle and the environment. So uh, we've seen a lot of changes. But uh, you know, one of the old myths was that all calories are created equal, where mm -hmm. you had a, a carbohydrate source, it, it didn't seem to matter. Uh, they, they were equal in terms of uh, how their quality was viewed. And, and now we know that that's not true, uh, that we can uh, really see differences in not only carbohydrate sources, but fat sources and protein sources in terms of the quality of the calories that they're uh, providing and all the other nutrients as well. Totally. And I think that's something, you know, especially to the women who are joining us now, by the way, ladies, say hi to us. We're doing this live. Let us know where you're from. And if you have any questions for Dr. Michael Murray, let us know. You can drop them in the comments below. But I think this is something women have struggled with for a long time is that they've been told if you want to lose weight, you just need to eat right and exercise it's calories in and calories out. And it's left a lot of women really frustrated. When uh, it comes to balancing hormones, like what are some foods that women can consider to leverage to you know, eliminate things like PMS, mood swings, and sticky weight that doesn't seem to want to budge? Well, one of the big factors, I think, for a lot of these complaints that, that women have, and men as well, are uh, related to nutrient insufficiencies. Uh, it may not be to the level where you see a, 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 a clear deficiency, but for example, if we look at magnesium intake, the magnesium intake uh, per capita in the U.S. is about 160 milligrams per day, and the need is much higher than that. The RDI, recommended dietary intake, is 350 to 400 milligrams per day. And the reason is, is that we're not eating enough whole foods rich in, in magnesium. And uh, that nutrient alone has been shown to have really good results in, you know, elevating uh, mood and uh, lowering blood pressure, reducing uh, migraine headaches, and, and a long list of other issues as well. So, I think eating a more magnesium-rich diet, focus on whole foods, uh, nuts and seeds are high in, uh, in magnesium, in particular green leafy vegetables, those sort of things. 
Yeah. And I'm so glad that you touched on magnesium because it's definitely, you know, there, and this is something where uh, you were, you started this conversation with how there is research to support this. We know magnesium can lower prostaglandins, which is driving women's menstrual cramps. Magnesium is needed in the synthesis of important neurotransmitters. So absolutely. I think magnesium is one of those minerals that nobody is really eating enough of. And especially, you know, the way that you framed it, I mean, the standard American diet Let's talk about that. Like the standard American diet, um, what is that for women who don't know? And when you say a whole foods diet, how does that differ? <laughs> yeah, the uh, standard American diet, uh, just the, uh, the first letters say it all. It's sad. Mm -hmm. And uh, it focuses a lot on processed foods, uh, high uh, refined carbohydrate intake, eating the wrong types of fat, not getting enough of the uh, omega-3 fatty acids or the monounsaturated fats that we get from olive oil, nuts, and seeds. So we see certain patterns of uh, disease in people that eat the standard American diet. Uh, um, obesity, increased risk of chronic degenerative diseases like heart disease and cancer, strokes, diabetes, macular degeneration. On the flip side, a whole foods diet, if we look at the medical literature, one of the best uh, diets is the uh, traditional Mediterranean diet. Now, that doesn't mean that you go out and eat more pasta <laughs> and pizza. It, it means you adopt the, uh, the eating ways of the uh, traditional Mediterranean region, and, and that focuses a lot on, on vegetables, on, on fish, uh, really a, a varied diet full of a lot of variety of different uh, uh, vegetables, uh, nuts, seeds, and, and those sort of things, rich in phytonutrients that help nourish our body and, and protect against disease. So what we see in looking at the research is that the, the people that uh, consume that traditional Mediterranean diet had a lower rate of all the chronic degenerative diseases. And one of the key reasons is that this diet reduces inflammation uh, quite significantly. And we now know that, that many of the chronic uh, degenerative diseases like heart disease, like Alzheimer's disease, are really inflammatory diseases. So uh, eating to reduce inflammation is a good dietary strategy. The standard American diet, it really inflames our body. Uh, eating a diet rich in plant foods uh, and, and also getting those, those long chain omega-3 fatty acids goes a long way in reducing inflammation. Yeah. And, you know, we've got a bust of fat myth. So I, I do want to acknowledge there are ladies from all over the world. We've got women in the UK, North Carolina saying hi to us. But women have uh, struggled. I struggled. I mean, I'm going to put my hand up and say, I convinced myself that I did not like butter and that I didn't like fat at all and had this completely fat-free diet thinking that was the healthiest way to eat. Let's talk about the issues with a fat-free diet and you know how fat is not all created equal. Yeah, uh, we kind of vilified fat for many, many years and, and now we know that it's really, I think, the foundation of a healthy diet, but you have to eat uh, health-promoting fats. And uh, the, the best fats are those uh, that uh, we get from uh, nuts and seeds and, and their, their oils, as well as uh, cold water fish. Uh, and uh, these include the monounsaturated fats like we get from olive oil, and then the omega-3 fatty acids that we get from fish and walnuts and chia and flax seeds. These are really important to our diet. Uh, what the standard American diet is full of is damaged fats as well as too much of the omega-6 fatty acids. And uh, these uh, fats are found in uh, all your regular vegetable oils, uh, safflower, sunflower, corn, soy. They're rich in the omega-6 fatty acids. And uh, these oils tend to be pro-inflammatory while the monounsaturated fats and the omega-3 fats help to reduce inflammation. Mm -hmm. And we have Katie on here saying that she also did fat free all through high school and it messed up her hormones. <laughs> so <laughs> you're not for, alone, Katie. For sure, for yeah. sure, because we need uh, we need the right types of fats to to build hormones, and uh, these fatty uh, acids are actually converted to hormone like substances called prostaglandins or uh, eicosanoids, and they play a huge role in controlling many aspects of our our bodily functions. So. Uh, yeah, uh, we got to get the right types of fat in our diet or we're not going to function properly.
Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. And now, you know, it's funny, after I had my son, I was postpartum, I couldn't get enough fat. And when you realize like what the, what the female brain goes through after yeah. having a baby, and you're like, I, I got to have blood sugar balance, I need to rebuild my brain, plus I'm making breast milk. Yeah, let me tell you a, a study that was really interesting. You know, our, our brain is literally a vat of fat and the type of fat that we consume in the diet determines the type of fat that we have in in our brain. They mm -hmm. did a study uh, a couple of years ago that I found very provocative. It was a study done in uh, college freshmen. 78% of the participants in the study were women, uh, and they were coming in for depression. And uh, rather than uh, a study to look at the effects of an antidepressant drug, this was a study looking at the effects of fish oil supplementation as a first-line therapy in the treatment of depression. And I found out a lot of interesting facts in reading this study. Uh, for example, it's estimated that as many as 50% of incoming college freshmen have had suicidal ideations, and uh, depression is very prevalent in that freshman year. Mm -hmm. And what they found was is that putting these subjects in either a placebo group or a fish oil treatment group, that those that got the fish oil within the first 21 days 80% of them were completely cured of their depression. That's better than you'd ever see with any antidepressant drug. Uh, a lot of times those double-blind studies with fish oils were in people who had been on other drugs or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have had long-standing depression, but this was, was really a, a, a different uh, setup. And in contrast, the group in the, uh, taking the placebo, only about 6% of them saw uh, a complete resolution of their depression. So it was night and day. And it just really goes to show you how important it is to have the right types of fats. And this is really a, a, a we're making a public service announcement here because I know many of your viewers uh, may have children that are uh, beginning, uh, they're, they're in their first year of college. Uh, get them on fish oils. <laughs> Make sure they're getting those those uh, beneficial fats. The study uh, used only, I think it was a thousand milligrams of EPA and DHA. For depression, I like to go higher than that, about 3,000 milligrams of EPA mm -hmm. and DHA each day. Uh, but they still got really good results just at that 1,000 milligrams per day dosage. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. And you also, you got to think about what, what happens when kids go away to college. Like if they're not eating dorm food, then they're, they, you know, I'm a mom. I have a, I have a small child. He's only five now, but I'm, I, you know, that day is going to come where he's going to have free reign over his food. And so yeah. that's a fascinating study and super helpful to know, you know, they used a thousand milligrams. I agree clinically, you know, I find the most positive therapeutic effect when we go above 2000 milligrams of the combined EPA and DHA. You know, I have a question question here from Jill. She wants to know your view on cow's milk and what have you seen in the research about cow's milk? And she says, surely cow's milk is full of hormones. Yeah. Um, you know, you asked me about uh, dietary myths and I was going to say one big myth is that everybody needs milk. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I don't consume milk uh, in, 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 in milk form. I will have fermented uh, uh, dairy, you know, yogurt, kefir, uh, those sorts of, of foods. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think nowadays uh, the almond milks, the coconut milks, they're delicious and they're, mm. they're lower in calories and, and uh, I think great, they have great nutrition. Uh, we can get uh, calcium from uh, eating more uh, green leafy vegetables. You know, uh, a, a, gl a glass of kale juice has more calcium than a, a, a glass of milk. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we can we can find ways to to bolster our calcium intake. And it's it's interesting if you look if you look globally. First of all, uh, people are told to drink milk because it's rich in in calcium and it can help build strong, healthy bones. But if you look globally. The, the areas where they have the highest milk intake have the highest fracture rate, the mm -hmm. uh, osteoporosis. If, if milk was preventive of those uh, fractures, we'd see just the opposite. So, uh, and there's been a lot of research to understand why 
milk uh, is associated with increased fractures. It's thought that the vitamin A in the milk reduces vitamin D absorption and that, that the, the high calcium levels will inhibit the absorption of, of many other minerals such as magnesium, which we talked about earlier. So um, yeah, so uh, my take on milk is that it's, it, it, it tends to be a, a, a food that a lot of people are allergic to or have intolerance to. If you're mm -hmm. going to use it, I think you use it uh, in moderate amounts and, and preferably in some fermented form. Uh, those are my, my basic guidelines. Mm -hmm. And we see it being a big trigger for hormonal acne too. It's like one of the first things if you cut out, like yeah. I know yeah. so many women, they're like, if I had known just to put the milk down and I wouldn't yeah. have acne, I would have done that instead yeah. of all the antibiotics. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're great. I was just going to bring that up. I was going to say, you've got great skin. And they oh, did thank a study, you. <laughs> uh, I mean, they've done a, a, several studies looking at uh, milk intake and as a uh, acne uh, forming uh, food. And uh, what they identified is that it, it, it has these uh, molecules called insulin-like growth factors. And uh, they basically <laughs> form, uh, <laughs> promote the formation of pimples. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, getting kids with acne off, off of milk and, and uh, sometimes chocolate, particularly if it's milk chocolate, uh, mm -hmm. those are good recommendations. Totally. Now, you know, before we started this conversation, I actually had um, lots of my readers were sending in questions and a big one, and I'm sure this comes up in your Healing Power of Food Summit, but your stance on soy and soy products for women. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think there are a few foods that are vilified on the internet, uh, and they're, they're taking research out of context. Uh, and I see a lot of crazy uh, statements about soy for example, uh, they say that soy is only eaten in Asian countries in a fermented form. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I've been to China, I've been to Asia, that's not true. Uh, I mean, anyone who's ever been to a Japanese restaurant and had ed edamame knows that that's, that's not true. Um, I, I think that uh, soy in moderation is fine for just about anybody. Uh, we know that soy consumption early in life is associated with a protective effect against breast cancer. Uh, we know that it has protective effects against prostate cancer. I, I think that uh, what we tend to do in the U.S. is that we jump on something and, and we start over consuming it. And mm -hmm. uh, so for a while there, uh, you know, probably in the 90s especially, soy was in everything. And I think that that was problematic because... Theoretically, you could in increase the intake of those soy phytoestrogens or isoflavones, and it could interfere with thyroid function, and it may have some, some – they're really more estrogen blockers than they are estrogen agonists, but you could see some, some possible hormonal uh, changes because of, uh, of, of too much soy, especially these, these highly concentrated sources of those, those phytoestrogens, which you'd, you'd find in, in a lot of those soy foods. Mm -hmm. Soon back then, uh, so I don't see those as being as popular these days. Uh, I think that uh, we've seen a lot of improvements in the natural food industry, and one of them is uh, you know uh, better vegan alternatives to uh, mm -hmm. standard meat dishes, you know like hot dogs and hamburgers and whatnot. You know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it was all soy, and now we have a variety of different uh, uh, plant proteins that are being used. Absolutely. And I agree. That's where we've really gotten ourselves in trouble with soy. And I, I have all my patients, you know, it's part of an elimination diet. We pull out soy to test and to see how it's doing for them because it can be, you know, it can cause food, or, you know, be part of a food sensitivity picture. But the, I think the really big problem is that you eat a piece of chocolate. It has soy in it. Like you go get a latte. Is it a soy latte? And then people were just overdoing it with the soy, which is why I tell my ladies, I'm like, look, don't, don't go chasing tofu. Just know that when you eat out, you're probably going to come across soy. It's going to show up in other places, but it's when we we kind of, you know, we, we, you're absolutely right. We want to vilify one food and we want to put another on a pedestal. And once we put it on the pedestal, everybody goes crazy eating it all the time. Like we saw the kale rage that happened, <laughs> but yeah. that can be a yeah. problem. I mean, the human diet, it, it needs variety. I mean, that's part of the secret sauce to help. Boy, I, I love that. And that's something that we know. Uh, if we look at the Mediterranean diet that I mentioned earlier, one of the advantages of that diet is that it is so diverse. And what we're learning about health and nutrition is that food plays a, a, a predominant role in the health of our microbiome. That's the mm -hmm. intestinal flora. 
uh, and the microbiome, in order to be healthy, has to be diverse, has to have a diversity of uh, microbes, and uh, that correlates to dietary diversity. So most Americans, we eat the same foods over and over and over again, and, and I encourage people to try new things, try new recipes, try new foods, uh, mix it up a lot. Uh, take advantages of the spices and herbs that we have. I mean, these are concentrated sources of vegetables, basically, and they're concentrated sources of phytochemicals. Uh, so spice it up, uh, and that's just not hot spicy, but also herb spicy. Yeah, totally. Well, and that's the thing is that I think a lot of people um, overlook that culinary herbs actually have medicinal properties. And whereas like, you know, maybe people are using oregano essential oil for, you know, cold flu, things, those things in particular, but you can be cooking with oregano all the time. And all of this is, is just information to the microbiome in the body. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it was one of the interesting things that's happening right now in, in research is that uh, because they're trying to get away from antibiotics in the feed industry, they're looking to natural products. And, mm -hmm. and what we're seeing are some really incredible uh, effects from uh, things like cinnamon and oregano and these volatile compounds that are in peppermint and, and other mint family uh, 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 spice or herbs, I should say. And it's, it's really amazing. Uh, I think that's the future. Uh, I believe that the, uh, the future of medicine is food, and that's the theme of our summit, the Healing Power of Food Summit that we have. It starts uh, on Saturday, uh, October 13th, and runs for nine nights. That's awesome. Tell us a little bit more about it. I was, I registered, I was checking it out. You have an Great. awesome speaker lineup. The talks look phenomenal and it is like, it is some of the, you know, you're going to get like access to information that's not being taught even in nutrition or medical schools yet. This is like hot off the research press. Yeah, we have uh, just a, an all-star lineup of experts. Uh, we have 35 experts, uh, many are names that people are familiar with, uh, Mark Hyman, uh, Jeff Bland, uh, Joe Pizzorno, uh, many uh, great uh, speakers uh, talking about things they're most passionate about, how it relates to the healing power of food. That's that's the name of the, the summit, Healing Power of Food Summit. Uh, and it's free. And we have a link, ladies. There's a link right below. You can click that, and it's free. Yeah, it's free, and and it's it's all done online. And uh, we have three to four speakers each day. It's it's really a a, a, a fantastic event, and, and I encourage everybody to check it out. Yeah, well, I'm really excited. So it's starting this Saturday, and then it's going to run for over a week. People are going to get access to these talks every day, new information coming out. You do have some of the leading experts, the people who are really starting to change the health industry and the conversation around food. So I want to encourage everyone listening, if you eat, you need to be there. And I'm pretty <laughs> yeah, sure you absolutely. all do. <laughs> And, you know, it's so much fun to learn about uh, the healing power of food. It's very inspiring, and it, I think it, it, it makes us more mindful of, of, about our choices, our food choices, because uh, our health, to a very large extent, comes down to that decision of what we choose to put in here. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's fun to learn about how these foods work. And, uh, again, I encourage people to sign up. They won't be disappointed. There's there's lots of uh, great information, a lot of free gifts, and uh, it really is a, a celebration on the healing power of food. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's food, you guys. Like, we get to talk about delicious food all the time. <laughs> yeah. So this has been an awesome conversation. So much knowledge shared here that's going to help so many people. I mean, this is just like a taste of what is about to go down this weekend. So I want to say thank you. We will be sharing that with everyone because I think this message that you are bringing to the world is so important. It's, it's absolutely critical to everyone's health. So thank you again for joining me and for taking the time out of your day to share all of this wisdom. All right, thank you very much. Great, live streaming is over.